Okay, this is lecture three from Gaddis. There we go. Okay, so one of the issues of the Cold War is that there are things that are going on that are not part of the Cold War, but the Cold War sweeps them up into the mix that is the Cold War. One of those issues is decolonization. So uh, after World War II, the colonial world controlled by Europeans uh, began to fall apart. And as it fall, fell apart, new states were being created. And these new states and their, uh, their birthing uh, became part of this Cold War conflict as well. So both the United States and the Soviet Union uh, were opposed to colonization. The United States um, had a, a small amount of colonization. Uh, if you disregard uh, the, uh, the thievery of Native American lands, um, then the United States history is largely uh, not colonial, but uh, it's a different type of occupation for the most part uh, than European states. Uh, so both the United States and Soviet Union were opposed to colonization. We saw at the conclusion of World War I, Woodrow Wilson's uh, 14 points called for um, the, uh, democr uh, the giving democracy to uh, people to choose their own governments, which was a challenge to the idea of uh, colonization. Well, after World War II, the colonial world starts to fall apart. Khrushchev sees this as an opportunity to further Soviet aims. And so he embraces what he calls uh, wars of liberation, which are um, fostering uh, uh, rebel efforts against colonial authorities. Colonial authorities were Europeans, so we have to keep that in mind as well. So the U.S. is in a difficult spot. So they are charged with trying to protect their European allies. They want them to recover. Uh, and those European allies are also the colonial powers. So the British, the French, the Dutch, and the Portuguese uh, are all states that the United States is seeking to help recover as allies against Soviet expansion, but at the same time, they also have um, overseas colonial possessions that are becoming tumultuous. So uh, the United States is forced with a decision, um, and uh, I'll give you an example. Um, with the conclusion of World War II, the United States had been uh, fostering uh, national efforts against Japanese occupation, most notably in Vietnam. Well, Vietnam was a, a former French colony, and the French wanted it to be a colony again. Uh, they wanted to uh, recover their territory from the Japanese. So the United States was in a tough spot because there were people within the government who said, we were aiding the Vietnamese during the war in their, their fight against the Japanese, and we should continue to aid them in forming their own state. There's also other people in the State Department who were arguing France needs uh, to recover its uh, economic and uh, military might, uh, and they are asserting they can only do so with their colony. So the United States was kind of um, in a tough spot, but when those uh, issues came to the fore, the United States uh, supported the, their European allies, which were their colonial powers. So uh, what happens is, the United States is supporting colonial powers and trying to tamp down these rebellions. Many of these rebellions are uh, rebellious folks are looking for any help they can get and they find it with uh, Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. So uh, this, uh, these movements about creating their own states, they're national revolutions, but because they're aligned or uh, supported by the Soviets, they get bound up in the Cold War or because they're challenging U.S. allies, the uh, British, French, Portuguese, etc. So then the United States sides on the colonial power side against the, the rebellious, rebellious side uh, as well, these nationalist revolutions. That problem of uh, disentangling what is nationalism from communism was something that the United States did, um, had a hard time uh, figuring out how to disentangle those two different strands of ideas. You also have something that's very curious, uh, which is so you have the, the states that are aligned with the United States called the West, and then you have the, uh, the states aligned with the Soviets, uh, known as the Communist Bloc, which in the thinking of the United States and the West included China. Uh, and so then you have a bunch of states who are uh, what they call the non-aligned states. Uh, they haven't uh, really signed on to one side or the other. And so it, this gives them a certain amount of power because they can tilt, as they say, one side or the other, 
Um, so if they uh, lean towards the Soviets, the Soviets are giving them more aid. And so to tilt them the other way, the United States will uh, offer them more aid. And so maybe then they'll switch the other way, trying to extract more uh, money or uh, munitions or whatever from uh, the other side. So um, Gaddis calls this the power of powerlessness in which states say, you got to prop me up because if I collapse, then this country is going to go communist in the case uh, of the United States. So uh, one of the arguments that uh, the um, nationalist regime in South Vietnam made, the Diem regime, was that without this full United and continuing United States support, then they would collapse and then Vietnam would go communist. So um, this <clears throat> power powerlessness is something that um, it, it doesn't fit how you would normally think of these two great powers and their relations. Uh, the threat of collapse would induce um, the superior power, whether it's the United States or the Soviets, the superpowers, uh, to support a, a nation even when it's not necessarily in their best interest. But it's a power that they have because they can say we're going to fall uh, apart and then it'll become um, either uh, communist or it'll become aligned with West. So. This brings us, uh, Gaddis talks to 1968, which he calls the season of discontent. Um, and this is, there's a lot of elements that go into it. One of which uh, is there's this enormous boom of the uh, young population born after World War II, which we call here in the United States, the baby boomers, but it's actually a global uh, phenomenon in which you have an enormous um, population burst um, that is now in the mid sixties reaching uh, young adulthood. Uh, so you have a boom of young people, uh, you marry that with higher education. Um, more young people were attending college at any time uh, in human history, uh, not just, again, not just here in the United States, but elsewhere. Uh, and um, so you have a global boom of young educated people. Uh, and all around the globe, you have discontent with how things are at the moment. These young educated people uh, are um, uh, rejecting uh, the larger society in which they're operating in and they want to change things. So you have um, a global unrest, right? So we uh, most clearly associated with the United States here in the United States, when we think about protests against the Vietnam War or you know, the counterculture movement or whatever. So that's part of it. Um, uh, but it's also, um, they're reaching out to each other at the same time and they're taking inspiration from each other. So this is a global movement of uh, unrest um, and uh, it's largely unplanned, uh, except in the case of China, who sought to unleash their young people to uh, strengthen Mao's power, which was part of uh, what was known as the Cultural Revolution, right? So you have a series of um, destabilizing domestic um, protest movements that um, are operating independently all around the globe, but they have as their common ingredients lots of young people, uh, many of which are in colleges, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So 1968, the sort of, uh, here in the United States, there's sort of a uh, rejection of this sort of unrest, and there's an establishment of a, uh, a governing uh, administration who uh, plays up the idea that they are representing um, the silent majority, as they refer to them, and it's a conservative law and order uh, administration. This is the Nixon administration. And so Nixon comes to political power in the election of 1968 with the idea that he's going to install law and order at home, as he refers to it. Uh, and he also uh, campaigned on a pledge to resolve a, uh, this difficult problem the United States was facing in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, Nixon uh, claimed he had a plan to get the United States out of the war. Uh, and so this too uh, helped account for his electoral success in 1968. Uh, eventually, Nixon, uh, his plans take the form of what's known as triangular diplomacy. Uh, and in order to understand triangular diplomacy, we have to know a little bit about the relationship between the Soviet Union and China at this time. So um, the thinking in the 1950s and into the early 1960s was that um, 
the Soviet Union was directing China, that uh, China was uh, operating at the behest of Moscow, as they referred to it. Uh, and so uh, these two uh, colossus communist powers were acting in unified one step. But what increasingly became clearer over the course of the 1960s was that there was quite a bit of tension and friction between uh, the Soviet Union and China. Uh, the United States had refused to recognize China, the communist Chinese government, as the governing body of China. Uh, it's very odd. I've seen 1950s global maps in which the outline of China is just blank. Uh, that uh, the people who made the globe refused to recognize that China um, was part of the planet, right? And so because the United States refused to recognize that the communist China was the, um, the government of um, the Chinese mainland, um, the United States had no relations with China. Um, the Soviets border China and increasingly it became apparent to the United States that was there was more than a little bit of tension between uh, the Chinese and the Soviets. Um, and uh, whether or not um, there, this was a belief, it was abundantly clear when you had Soviet and Chinese uh, border forces uh, in the hundreds of thousands shooting at one another. That was a pretty clear intention um, or pretty clear indication that things were not operating great between the two states. And so Nixon saw this uh, as a, a potential wedge that he could use to um, extract some uh, further goals for the United States. So uh, Nixon secretly um, um, sent some emissaries to negotiate with China. Uh, and um, in a, a grand and shocking event, um, Richard Nixon flew to China uh, where he met with Mao Zedong. And so a little bit of Nixon's background here is useful as well. Nixon's political career began as an ardent anti-communist, and that was his hallmark, right? He was uh, an ardent, ardent anti-communist um, who always took the tough line with the communists. Uh, as um, the vice president for Eisenhower, he had been engaged in a visit to the Soviet Union where he had gotten into a debate with Soviet officials over the nature of the two governments. Uh, it's called the kitchen debate. Um, he was always hardline on um, dealing with China, refused to recognize the Chinese government. So when it was announced that Nixon was going to meet with Mao in China, it was a shocking event. <coughs> Excuse me. And so Nixon, um, met with China, which immediately alarmed the Soviets. And the Soviets uh, began to reach out to Nixon to have some sort of um, uh, negotiation uh, to resolve some of the conflicts, right? And so triangular, triangular diplomacy has three parts to it. So we'll talk about what the three parts. So what did China want? China's fearful of the Soviet Union. Uh, the tensions between the Chinese and the Soviets were ratcheting up. The Soviets have an enormous by this uh, early 1970s, uh, an enormous nuclear stockpile uh, that represented direct threat to China. Uh, what did the Soviets want? The Soviets were fearful of a US-Chinese alliance. The Chinese have not many nuclear weapons, but they have an enormously large army that's on the border with the Soviet Union. Uh, and the United States, although on the other side of the globe, uh, has the ability to deliver with pinpoint accuracy a uh, number of uh, nuclear weapons. So the combination of those two things put a lot of fear uh, into um, the Soviet Union. They also were facing increasing pressures in Eastern Europe. Uh, the occupation uh, of Eastern Europe was still expensive and difficult. And in 1968, that sort of uh, young uh, population uh, discontent movement reared its head in Czechoslovakia, where uh, the Czechoslovakian uh, government um, was under pressure by its citizens to petition for the removal of Soviet Soviets. There was a little bit of loosening in Czechoslovakia. It's known as the Prague Spring. And then the, the Soviets under um, the uh, leader who emerged as the power after uh, evicting Khrushchev Leonid uh, Brezhnev 
uh, ran the tanks into Czechoslovakia and crushed the Prague Spring down in the same way that Khrushchev had crushed Hungary. So uh, these tensions in Eastern Europe were continuing after the Soviets uh, had asserted uh, control over these territories again. So they were looking for a way to relieve some of that pressure. For the United States, what did they want? The United States wanted the pressure of the Soviets. They wanted to see if they can extract um, some negotiations to lead to lessen the tensions between the United States and Soviet Union. And they also wanted to get out of Vietnam. And so Nixon believed that he could get the Soviets and the Chinese to pressure the North Vietnamese government to come to the negotiating table. Uh, and so would pressure them uh, to negotiate with the United States so that the U.S. could exit this war in Vietnam. Uh, the, the North Vietnamese were completely reliant on the, the military supplies they were relieving from the, the Soviet Union and some degree from China, but mostly it was being sent by the Soviets through uh, China to get to the North Vietnamese. Uh, and the Soviets, as part of the tensions between the Soviets and China, the Chinese were stealing quite a bit of that military uh, uh, equipment. So Nixon's triangular diploma diplomacy is seeking to exploit these tensions between the two communist powers to further U.S. aims, and each side is looking to gain something out of it, right? So, sorry about that. I have a sticky key. Okay. So as Nixon is uh, pursuing foreign policy goals, um, through triangular diplomacy and through what we'll talk about a little bit later, this business of detente, uh, he also was seeking to uh, reassert his control at home. Uh, and this came in the form of uh, a series of incidents that become known as Watergate. Uh, Watergate was, as uh, Nixon's um, uh, spokesperson said, a third rate burglary, um, which was, um, Nixon uh, was running for re-election in 1972, and he wanted to ensure that he would have a tremendous victory, uh, both because uh, that would massage his personal ego, uh, and also because when you have a huge victory, it gives you a mandate to get things done in legislative fashion. So Nixon was uh, wanting to get this huge victory, and so he pulled out all the stops. Now, part of the, uh, one of the things I told you about Nixon is that he was anti-communist, he also had a reputation well-earned um, as someone who engaged in political dirty tricks. And so he was willing, uh, he considered this part and parcel of the way politics was done, that you, know, you, you take any advantage you can get. Uh, so um, Nixon um, is authorizing these, uh, his long political career, he had authorized political dirty tricks to get uh, elected. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 1968, Nixon identified Edmund Muskie as someone who would be a threat to him in the primary. So Nixon's, um, someone in the Nixon team uh, wrote up a false letter that suggested that uh, Edwin Muskie's wife had referred to Canadians um, in a derogatory term. She referred to them as Canucks. And so that letter, was released secretly to um, a newspaper editor in New Hampshire. New Hampshire, as we know, is one of the earliest primaries. Uh, so um, this letter was published in the paper, um, and Edmund Muskie was quite uh, distraught about it because it was, uh, he was saying it wasn't true. The reason is it wasn't true. Uh, but uh, when uh, Muskie was defending the honor of his wife, and a television interview on the street, um, he started tearing up, uh, and that was considered a sign that Edwin Muskie was too weak um, to be president. So it destroyed Edwin Muskie's um, uh, effort at running for the Republican primary in 1968, which helped Richard Nixon. So um, that's just one small example of the sort of things that the Nixon administration or Nixon himself had done politically for years to win elections. So um, this uh, Watergate case was um, some uh, members of Nixon's uh, reelection team, known as the Committee to Reelect the President, CREEP, uh, had authorized dirty tricks. And one of the things they were going to do uh, 
uh, was to bug the Democratic National Headquarters in the Watergate complex so they could get insight on what the Democrats are doing for the election. Uh, unfortunately uh, for Nixon, but for everybody else, uh, these guys got caught in the act. And as they got caught in the act, they were taken uh, to prison where some intrepid uh, newspaper reporters from the Washington Post um, came across a nighttime blotter that um, uh, four people were uh, arrested inside the Democratic National Headquarters and a fifth person was arrested outside. Uh, so um, they began to investigate this story and uh, the, the burglary was before the uh, election, uh, but the details of this began to uh, accumulate after uh, Nixon's landslide reelection. The thing that turned out to be um, the most important ev evidence of all is that it turned out that um, Nixon had been secretly recording everything that went on in the Oval Office. Uh, and so uh, Judge uh, Sirica ruled uh, that those tapes need to be made um, available to the court so they could determine whether or not testimony that suggested Richard Nixon would, had known about the burglary after the fact and had sought to prevent the investigation those cases or those charges were starting to accumulate from people in lower levels of the Nixon administration who were claiming this was the case. Uh, the case, uh, whether or not he had to turn over those uh, uh, recordings went all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled eight to zero that he had to. And once the recordings of, this, uh, uh, of the uh, events in the Oval Office were revealed, there were two effects. The legal effect was that and uh, it was uh, abundantly clear that Nixon uh, was made aware of the break-in, uh, even if he had not directly authorized it and had actively engaged in trying to cover it up. Uh, he told the F director of the FBI to uh, inform the police this was a matter of national security and they shouldn't investigate. Uh, he told his chief deputies uh, to pressure people to lie about what was going on. They authorized this uh, spending of uh, money from his slush fund to pay people off abundantly clear. Uh, the other part about that is the um, rhetoric that Nixon engaged in the White House uh, was decidedly unseemly. He referred to ethnic groups by derogatory names. Uh, he cursed a lot. Um, he was uh, vain and spiteful and mean and all those things were revealed. So uh, what all this means is that uh, he was forced to resign um, before he was impe impeached uh, and the presidency um, the, and the nation went under, underwent a sharp test as to uh, the power of Congress and the Constitution when you have a lawless chief executive. Uh, okay, so Gaddis talks about the, this Watergate uh, story and he folds it into sort of a larger question, right? So the larger question is, um, what is it that motivates United States policy? And he argues that it's the idea of justice. But how do you attain it is the big problem, right? So um, the United States going back uh, to creating the United Nations wanted to ensure that um, there was a way to um, protect um, the interests of the United States and other states um, from sort of the, the large number of voting states. So within the United Nations, which is um, a forum for all nations to come uh, and present uh, their problems and vote on uh, issues that, uh, other, uh, that affect international concerns, they also created a powerful smaller group called the Security Council. And on the Security Council, uh, much in the way that the, the four policemen were envisioned by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Security Council has permanent members whose veto can block any action taken by the United Nations. And so this is an, an issue of wanting to allow um, a global approach, but also recognizing certain states, United States, Britain, Soviet Union, uh, France, um, have interests that need to be protected. So you have the Security Council. So um, the United States is seeking to pursue what they see as justice, right? As, as other states um, getting a fair treatment. Um, but what happens, uh, according to Gaddis, is that 
this conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, the United States wants to play fair, right? Wants to allow people to have elections and make their own decisions, but the Soviets do not. So uh, in their occupied territories of Eastern Europe, there aren't elections. There are uh, governments that are installed by Joseph Stalin uh, and elections become uh, fake elections in which the candidate wins 99.9%, .9%, right? So um, this is clearly unjust. And the Soviets are also engaging in unjust methods outside of their occupied states. So for example, uh, in the Italian elections, the Soviets were uh, delivering money and uh, intimidating opponents to communist candidates um, in the post-war Italian elections. So the United States is faced with a dilemma. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? Um, the United States chooses to um, ensure justice by using unjust means. And what Gaddis argues is that these unjust means in the international arena, Nixon brought home uh, to the domestic arena in the form of Watergate. Uh, so the United States is still engaged in the struggle. Now, uh, we need to talk a little bit about these policies that the United States had engaged in under containment. Um, as Kennan uh, drafted this, and as Kennan argued, there's no clearer um, challenge than the policy of containment to allow people to choose which side they want to align with. Kennan was uh, certain that people would choose the United States side because allowing these states to govern themselves was a key component of the containment strategy. Um, the Soviets relied upon terror. And so Kennan was sure uh, that this was the, the best, best method, right? And containment also had the idea that there were certain places that we need to protect. We didn't have, we could not stop the Soviets from seeking expansion everywhere. Well, in um, 1949, there was a modification that was proposed to this containment policy, and it's known as NSC 68. What NSC 68 argues is that the United States should seek to stop um, expansion of the Soviets anywhere and use any methods necessary. This attempt to protect other states by using um, nefarious means as the United States uh, proposed it um, is manifest in things like the CIA's overthrow of the elected government in Iran in 1953, uh, the overthrow of the government in Guatemala in 1954, uh, the Bay of Pigs uh, attempt to in, uh, overturn the Cuban Revolution in 1961. All these things um, are part and parcel of this idea that unjust methods in the pursuit of just ends are, uh, uh, are something we can do. It also lends itself to presidential lies, right? So we see Eisenhower lying about the U-2. Uh, we see JFK laying, lying about the Bay of Pigs. Uh, we see LBJ lying about the trajectory of the Vietnam War, um, and most notably in the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So all these things are examples of the United States acting um, unjustly in what they believe to be just ends, right? So to prevent Vietnam from going communist, from overturning um, this uh, socialist communist revolution in Cuba, uh, and how it's going to mistreat their citizens by overturning the revolution. So these are all things that Gaddis sees as um, evolving in U.S. foreign affairs, right? Um, as Gaddis sees it, U.S. begins to sacrifice its best qualities at home by the use of questionable activities abroad. These are things that distort um, the actions of the government uh, of the United States, and they can't just be kept abroad. Right, so um, when these unjust methods which have been employed abroad are brought home, most clearly in the case of Nixon, this is, um, this is going to um, undermine the uh, authority the United States has, right? A lot of these unpleasant things uh, the United States have been engaged in were revealed in, in the Watergate backlash in which Congress asserted its authority and they began to investigate not only what Nixon did, uh, but also what the CIA had been up to, uh, and it leads, leads to the uh, passage of types of legislation designed to rein in this executive branch. So there's a feeling uh, 
that um, the U.S. is acting uh, in ways that are less than moral abroad, and it's beginning to contaminate the United States at home as well. Another aspect that's an outgrowth of this relationship between communist states and the West comes in the form of what's known as detente. And detente is something that grew out of both uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and also the policies of the Nixon administration, which were then continued through uh, the Ford administration into the Carter administration. And we'll talk about when they change um, next lecture with uh, the Reagan administration. So detente, um, anytime you wanna class something up, give it a uh, foreign name, especially a French foreign name. So detente, loosely translated, means relaxing. And it's about uh, loosening the tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. What the Cuban Missile Crisis revealed is that um, these tensions could be uh, world ending, right? And so uh, nobody wanted that to happen. So um, there, there, wanted, there had to be a way to um, prevent tensions from ratcheting up to the point where they almost destroyed the planet in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so one of the things that came out of that is that policy of MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, which said, um, if I know you can destroy me and you know I can destroy you, then it's in neither one of us uh, our interest to destroy one another because we'll all be destroyed, right? And so the idea that um, we can reach other decisions because on this issue, neither one of us want that outcome, right? Um, Another part that was an outgrowth of the Cuban Missile Crisis is the Soviet Union was humili humiliated because they were unable to match the U.S. ability to destroy uh, the other country, right? That's, uh, that was revealed when Khrushchev had to remove uh, those missiles from Cuba. After Cuba, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Soviets dedicated themselves to uh, constructing more nuclear weapons. And they caught up so much so that by the end of the 1960s into the beginning of the 1970s, in certain classifications of nuclear weapons, the, the Soviets were equal to the United States because they had dedicated such an effort, right? Um, this issue of detente is saying, is about let's negotiate some sort of relax, relaxing of the tensions between the two of us. And one of the easiest way to do so, and the clearest comparison that can be made is on nuclear weapons, what are referred to as strategic weapons. These are the weapons, atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, bombers, these things about delivering nuclear weapons to the other side. Um, they're, it, the destructive power of both are such that they're very comparable. Uh, and so uh, because these missiles are comparable, you can set a, um, a limit. So the United States said, we are continuing to make nuclear weapons because, or nuclear missiles because the Soviets are making nuclear missiles. And the Soviets say, we're making more nuclear missiles because the United States is making new nuclear missiles. So uh, detente said, let's meet for negotiations where we can set a ceiling and say, once we have 1,014 intercontinental ballistic missiles, we won't build any more, right? So once we hit that spot, we'll stop, right? The reason why is because combined, both sides had enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world 10 times over. So why continue to build so you can destroy it 12 or 14 times, right? So this detente uh, negotiation practice or uh, policy began during the Nixon administration uh, and it led to the creation of something known as SALT, which stands for Strategic Arms Limitations Talks, which results in the SALT Strategic Arms Limitations Treaty. This is about setting a ceiling, and it's because these things are very easy to compare, right? Uh, and both sides get advantages out of it. For the United States, they're no longer having to build these nuclear weapons, so they lose some of the expense of building that, right? So they can not spend as much money because um, building more really achieves no additional outcome. Uh, for the Soviets, this was very important. These SALT negotiations were very important because one of the things that the Soviets had was this deep sense of inferiority uh, be because they knew how far behind they were from the West. The West did not fully appreciate how far behind the Soviets were, but they certainly understood it. 
So this effort to catch up to the United States in intercontinental ballistic missiles was something that was consuming an enormous um, uh, part of the Soviet uh, uh, economic ability to produce. Um, and so when it was catching up to the United States, it began to feel that it was a legitimate power in the eyes of the world. And so when the United States agreed to negotiate as, uh, as equals, this was really important for the Soviets, um, so important that they were willing to um, make concessions that at the time they didn't think were very important, but turned out, according to Gaddis, to be very important indeed. The Soviets agreed to an international agreement known as the Helsinki Accords, which said it is, uh, it is the right of citizens within their state uh, to protest the ac activities of the government. Now, this is clearly not something that the Soviets considered binding to them. Uh, so uh, they were willing to sign these international accords, which uh, were designed to be a sign of Soviet goodwill on these issues. Uh, as we shall see, um, this uh, creation of the Helsinki Accords and the support it engenders in a segment of the population uh, would come to be manifest uh, in the activities of an individual known as Pope John Paul II. All right, so we'll stop there and we'll pick up next time uh, talking about Lecture 4.